Welcome to Lesson 11 of Inventive Problem Solving in Biomedical Engineering. Today we're going to talk about anticipatory failure determination, yet another tool of trees. And we're going to study this in the context of hazard analysis. First, I want to explain why I would want to talk about hazard and failures in the context of inventive problem solving. Well, it's because this word problem, up until now, has reflected what engineers typically use to refer to a challenge, like a math problem or a design problem. But in actual fact, problems exist everywhere, and they likewise require inventive problem solving. This is evident in today's reading assignment, which likewise you may have wondered why I asked you to read. Hopefully you got the take-home message that under even the best of circumstances with the best of technologies, errors will be made, that we are far from uh, perfection. In fact, the uh, subtitle of Atul Gawande's book is A Surgeon's Notes on an Imperfect Science. So it's somewhat incumbent on us to pay attention to um, risks and hazards so that both we, the engineer, don't design devices and inventions that uh, may fail, and so that we take into account that our inventions and devices are going to be used with human beings who are fallible and it's not entirely their fault when an error or accident occurs. There are things that we as the inventors can do to make devices uh, less likely to be um, misused or less susceptible to you. So this isn't just a good idea, it's actually the law. The Food and Drug Administration requires device manufacturers to have a formal hazard analysis in place. It's something to be generated from the very origins of an invention. In the initial stages of a development program, it has multiple stages, and it's modified as information becomes more available to the development team. It consists of three separate analyses what's called an initial hazard analysis, a fall tree analysis, failure modes and effects analysis. A variation of that is called a failure modes, effects and criticality analysis, or FAMICA. Um, you should have learned about these tools in um, medical devices class, and I'll confess that I uh, adapted this slide from uh, the course that I used to teach on medical devices. But I want to put the inventive problem solving in the context of uh, practical uh, scenario. Without going into great detail, I'd like to just give you an overview of the procedure for initial hazard analysis. Just to put a framework and a background uh, to inventive problem solving and anticipatory failure determination. So the first step takes place early in the design process, around the same time that you're creating user requirements. It involves developing a list of potential hazards and initially we create this list based on experience. For example, our experience with previous failures or specific failures that occurred in similar devices that are recorded by the FDA. And I have a couple of, uh, of resources there that are available to us through the Freedom of Information Act. And then we can proactively create a list of potential hazards based on interviews with people that have experience in that uh, use environment and with that technology. So by way of example, think of your own experience. Let's take, for example, um, air travel, something that I'm sure all of you have done at one point in time. If I were to ask you to make a list of all possible hazards that would be associated with, let's say, a transatlantic flight, you may think of all of the things that have gone wrong in the past, like missing a flight or a flight being canceled, uh, luggage getting lost, getting sick from breathing that recycled air, etc. So this is the usual way and the typical way we get started with listing, uh, but it's incomplete. I'll just speak from my own experience. I was involved for many years in developing a pediatric heart assist device, and I referred to the history of 
what's called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO for guidelines of things that could go wrong and you can see that this technology is replete with uh, adverse events with with uh, blood clots and neurologic problems and cardiovascular problems and metabolic problems uh, the percent reported incidence if you look at the second column is it's really horrendous I think I'd shown this slide before in a different context here's another story early in the origin of the artificial heart program University of Pittsburgh we began implanting a brand new device known as the NovaCore very soon into the program about the second or third patient it became evident that this device was generating a horrendous blood clot around one of the valves and it jeopardized the entire program and even uh, survival of the company now this was despite the fact that the device had undergone years and years of development animal testing bench testing hazard analyses it was an unexpected and catastrophic outcome so as a result this company which was once worth over a thousand dollars a share with great enthusiasm for future growth and profit eventually began to tank and uh, as of 2000 and Eight, it was worth about 17 cents and as of the present day they're basically bankrupt in this particular example it wasn't entirely unexpected there was in fact a precedent many years prior in the experience of the the Jarvik 7 artificial heart a similar problem occurred around the valves development of thrombus in 2020 hindsight it's easy to criticize but it illustrates um, the, the consequence of, of excessive confidence and hubris about uh, the quality of your design and overconfidence that nothing possibly could ever go wrong. Now this isn't an isolated incident. If you go to the FDA website, you'll see over a short period of time numerous, numerous recalls. Despite the best efforts of engineers to avoid them, things happen and uh, hazards occur, uh, things break, patients get injured. Again, I'm bringing this up now in the context of uh, inventive problem solving class because we're not just having fun with invention, we uh, ultimately hope for our inventions to make it into the marketplace, to make it into the clinic. So we need to be uh, practical and we need to be responsible when we create something new because in, in doing so, you're now exposing yourself to the Here's a famous case that illustrates the dangers of what you don't know you don't know. It happened a long time ago in 1922. This bank teller, Grace Fryer, was working in a watch painting factory. She started uh, exhibiting all kinds of, of nasty symptoms. Her teeth were falling out. Her jaw was swollen. Um, her bones were decaying. Her jaw bone became honeycombed. And similar cases began to appear throughout her hometown of New Jersey. It turned out that all of the women that was employed by this same watch painting factory at one time or another developed these symptoms. Now this was before we appreciated the dangers of radioactivity. They were using one of the most radioactive substances known to man, radium, to paint the faces of these watches to make them glow in the dark. And for what reason or another, I don't quite understand, they were putting the brushes in their mouth or licking the brushes uh, in the process of painting uh, these faces. So consequently they expose themselves to a tremendous amount of radioactivity uh, without realizing it. So in summary it's a perfect illustration of a hazard that's lurking that you could never have anticipated because knowledge just and experience just didn't exist Another source of uncertainty and potential risk of danger is the very fact that we're inventing devices that will be used by humans. And you should never underestimate what stupid things humans might do. A take-home message for medical device design 
is remember the user will find a way to cause an accident. So expect the user to do the unexpected. Now there's only so much you can do to prevent human errors. You can't design away their stupidity. But you can try to reconstruct or invent a way to cause an accident intentionally and thereby anticipate what might happen. And uh, that is in fact the... Um, have you ever looked at a label on a product and asked why is this label even necessary? Like this one, do not use for drying pets on the manual for a microwave oven. Caution, hot beverages are hot on a coffee cup. Well, the first case actually was in the news. There was a lady that actually put her cat in a microwave oven. The results were not pretty. The second has to do with a um, lawsuit that was awarded to a lady uh, by McDonald's for serving her a hot beverage, which she then proceeded to spill on her lap. Uh, you can read the rest of the list on your own. I don't need to read them to you. They're all kind of funny but they also illustrate just the extremes of what people can do that you would just never expect them to do. Sometimes the consequences of human error can be minor and other times they can be catastrophic. In this case of the Deepwater Horizon it was a, a sequence of events and failures of fail-safes etc. But the root cause was actually an operator with a joystick that pressed a series of buttons in the wrong order. The theory of failure analysis and hazard analysis is actually quite extensive. There are people whose careers are dedicated to it, departments and divisions and big companies that do nothing but risk analysis. I'll spare you some of the details, but I'd like to introduce just a couple of definitions that are relevant. So I've kind of simplified that last list to these uh, four or five definitions. The first is an accident. It actually has a, uh, a technical meaning and it refers to an unplanned, unexpected, and undesired occurrence, usually with an adverse consequence. An adverse event, abbreviated AE, is an injury that is caused by a medical management rather than the underlying condition of the patient. So it's an unintended uh, negative outcome. Adverse events attributable to an error is considered to be a preventable adverse event. An error has multiple meanings, but this is kind of a middle-of-the-road meaning. It's a failure of a planned action to be completed as intended. For example, an error of execution. Or use of the wrong plan to achieve an aim, an error of planning. You probably also heard the terms errors of commission and errors of omission. And then finally, a hazard. That is any threat to safety, for example, unsafe practices, conduct, equipment, labels, names, and the list goes on, as we will see in a moment. Question. What percent of preventable AEs are considered negligent? That means that someone is actually legally um, uh, culpable for that um, adverse event. You may be surprised to know that it's actually about half are uh, exposed to some type of legal Frequency of medical errors is declined, but you'd be astonished at how uh, common they are. So of all hospital admissions, AEs in New York in the most recent survey in 1984 is about 2.9%. Out of those, 58% are due to errors, and 13% are due are actually fatal, causing 98,000 deaths per year. Different parts of the country, it's greater, and other parts, it's less. If we were to compare this to fatalities due to, let's say, motor vehicle accidents per year, that's 43,000 in the whole country. Breast cancer, 42,000. AIDS, 16,000. So it's actually a major cause of mortality. It's the eighth most frequent cause overall. And also for comparison, the risk per flight of dying in a commercial airline is about one in eight million. Whereas the risk per hospital admission of dying from medical error is greater than one in a thousand, 
which is really uh, shocking and reprehensible. The cost, as you can imagine, is also astronomical. If you were to estimate all adverse events, what it costs to the U.S. economy, somewhere in the neighborhood of 37 to 50 billion dollars. Out of those, the preventable adverse events cost an estimated uh, 17 to 29 billion dollars. Half of that cost is due just to the health care to um, clean up the mistake that was made, or the, basically the extension of um, the hospital stay that was caused by the ev event or the error. It represents 4% of, of AEs and 2% of errors of all health care costs. What causes medical accidents? Well, there is definitely a component of technical failures. We just talked about product recalls and poor design. But a great proportion is human error. And I might argue that the human error is also partly a technical failure in that the product was not designed contemplating or anticipating the errors that humans might make and therefore um, was not human proofed if you will. Another consideration as far as hazards are problems that crop up later in time after a product is introduced. So we talked about achieving ideality and improving functions and making an optimal product. But then once the product has been in use for some period of time, some of the unanticipated failures uh, can appear. And it's yet another reason that some kind of early hazard analysis is valuable to prevent surprises that can be very expensive and maybe even uh, uh, catastrophic uh, later in time. Can you think of an example of some product that seemed to be doing just fine and then at some point began to evidence some kind of error? Well, I thought about this example. Uh, it shows my age. This is a movie that was, um, I don't remember when it came out, in the 80s, I think, but Steve Martin is called The Jerk. And in it, he designed this invention called the OptiGrab. It was a device for uh, removing your glasses without having to um, use two hands. And as a result, he became a billionaire or a multimillionaire. But then he later lost all of his fortune because the OptiGrab caused people to become uh, cross-sighted. Now, this is a kind of a, a, a silly, um, um, a fictitious example, but you have to wonder what the long-term consequences of some of the technology that we're seeing on the market today. Thalidomide is another classic case. Um, it's something uh, uh, that you may not know about. Or it was a thing of the past. But once upon a time, this drug was given to mothers to prevent morning sickness. It wasn't until a generation later that it was discovered thalidomide caused this birth defect of withered limbs um, in their offspring. And there are still adults living today that are the consequence of th thalidomide. Can you think of any other examples? Just in the recent news, there was the, uh, the Boeing uh, Dreamliner that had the lithium battery accident that caused millions of dollars and loss of, um, uh, of sales and uh, bad reputation. Um, Toyota had a massive recall for a sticky gas pedal. And really, the list goes on and on. One more definition, latent error. A defect in the design, organization, training, or maintenance in the system that leads to operator error and whose effects are typically delayed. So here's a, a small sampling of my collection of operator errors. This is one of my favorites. This one I'm told might be photoshopped, but this one isn't. A puddle that was deeper than they expected. This is an oops moment. That's kind of embarrassing. Also embarrassing. Another oops. And this is my favorite. It's kind of the definition of disasters waiting to happen. 
So it leads to Murphy's Law, something that doesn't show up in our textbooks, but every engineer knows Murphy's Law. What can go wrong will go wrong. Essentially, the laws of nature always are in motion, whether we're paying attention or not. Equipment blows to protect fuses. Multiple different variations. Interchangeable parents aren't. Fail-safes don't. Mrs. Murphy's corollary is Murphy was too much of an optimist. There's a whole book full of these. But everyone remembers the primary Murphy's Law in design. So then that leads us into um, the main trees-related topic today. Is how do we try to mitigate or anticipate some of these unexpected errors that we, for which we have no experience and we don't necessarily see coming? So we add to that previous list of potential hazard based on experience with those that we base on deduction. Maybe add some intuition, common sense. We can use the objective tree as a tool to predict failure. We can, uh, we can define failure uh, or design failure in an inverse fashion by asking how can a product fail to meet its objectives for safety and efficacy. And then there's anticipatory failure determination, uh, the trees today. So remembering one of the uh, objective trees for the artificial heart, we made a list of the things that it needs to do to provide function and safety. We ask ourselves systematically, how do we fail to provide these things? And that helps us not miss any of the potential categories. Then for good measure, I'd just like to complete the procedure. It's also an excerpt from my medical devices class, but just to kind of complete the, um, uh, the context. The next step, once you've created a list of potential failures, you work with your design team and you identify the possible causes for each hazard. Then you tabulate and, and sort those hazards in terms of a risk factor that is based on both the severity of the failure and the probability of its occurrence. And that's illustrated in this little table. So on the x-axis is the severity, on the y-axis is uh, the probability, and you can see that a frequent catastrophic uh, hazard is one that gets the, high, the, well, the lowest score. It goes to the top of the list. And the remote or improbable, um, negligible or marginal hazards, they're at the bottom of the list. Then you have to draw a line somewhere in that list. 1 to 5 is considered unacceptable from, let's say, a best practice FDA perspective. 6 to 9, undesirable, needs to be addressed and remediation um, procedure identified. 10 to 16, 17 to 20, you can see that um, those can be basically neglected if you so choose. Step 4 is now define the design features or a system response that eliminates or minimizes the occurrence of each of those unacceptable hazards. So this is the design step, the invention step that we have to add to our design process to mitigate the hazard. Labeling is the last resort. And then finally, once the hazard analysis is completed, you need to assure that the device still does what it was intended to do, that you haven't designed out its useful functions. So the design team must agree that the device, as described in the analysis, still meets the requirements. And again, for good measure, this is part of best practices. This is what companies do all the time. It's a control document. It's reviewed and approved by the development management team, and they get signed off at many different levels. So it's, it's really serious business. And unfortunately, there isn't an awful lot of guidance of how to create that list of hazards. I'd like to contrast this initial hazard analysis with something that you might be familiar, the fault tree analysis. This is something that is usually conducted after a design is in place. It's a top-down approach that analyzes potential system failures. It sounds like hazard analysis, 
but it's a deductive methodology for determining the potential causes of system events or failures, estimating the failure probabilities. It's centered around determining the cause of an undesirable event. So just by way of example, for a cell phone, this is a typical fall tree of selecting the top level failures and then identifying the different ways that that failure could be caused. Another cousin and also part of the ensemble of hazard analysis is something called failure modes effects analysis, FMEA, or sometimes failure modes effects and criticality analysis known as FAMICA. It's a bottom-up approach to analyze the potential system failures. It's used to identify potential failure modes determine their effects on the operation of the product, and then identify actions to mitigate the failures. So it's one by one looking at the components and asking how can each of these components or subsystems fail, or how can they somehow affect the overall system or induce a failure. And then to consider how that failure can propagate. So the design needs to be in place, as I said, to provide of analysis. FMEA is a crucial step in anticipating what might go wrong with a product. Normally, you formulate an exhaustive list of potential failure modes, although it's not possible to anticipate every failure mode, as we mentioned earlier. AFD is another useful tool in this. And just, again, returning to the uh, cell phone as an example, this kind of illustrates what an FMEA table would look like on a high level. Now we get to anticipatory failure determination, or AFD for short. It can be used both for risk management, asking the question what failures might occur, as we did in the fault tree analysis and the failure modes analysis, and also forensically, understanding why a failure did occur by looking at the potential causes that lead just by comparison, the conventional approach, known as a direct approach, FMEA, and there are many, many different variations, asks the question, what harm can happen? And it involves basically browsing for possible harm. It's an inexhaustible field of possible resources that can create or combine to create failure. The inverted approach, which is the AFD approach, is asking what harm can we make intentionally. So if we enumerate the different types of harm that we, let's say, wish to make intentionally, it limits the field of possible resources for harm, and it forces you to basically invent new ways of creating harm that you may not have anticipated. Let's take a simple example. What could be more harmless than a garden variety magic marker? Well, let's try to make it dangerous. Let's first list some of the resources. Here's a short list. It has a shape. It's round, so it's capable of rotating. It's plastic. Plastic has properties such as density, color, texture, flammability, um, lubricity, coefficient of friction. The ink has um, a solvent in it which is flammable. It has a sweet smell, um, a fragrant smell. It, it actually tastes sweet, uh, but it's toxic and it creates a mess. So combining those resources to cause harm or damage um, is not a difficult stretch of the imagination when you put together those resources in combination with the environmental resources, like the proximity to a coffee maker, or a young child, or um, a factory floor. So having identified potential hazards, we can now design in features to make them less hazardous. And I'm sure you've seen these in Walmart or Target. The washable type is kind of a no-brainer, but the triangular marker is a really brilliant invention. It eliminates that feature of roundness that can cause um, the failure modes of associated with the marker rolling or getting In Innovation Workbench, there's a small module that relates to anticipatory failure determination. It's this one listed 
toward the end of the process under reveal potential failures. The instructions are on the right, and I'm going to admit they're not particularly uh, elucidating or helpful. So I've kind of um, reorganized them somewhat to make them make a little bit more sense to me. So here's the procedure. You replace the question, what could fail, and why could a hazard occur, with how do I intentionally cause or invent a failure or an event. So now you have a new inventive problem, and you try to solve that new problem using the TRIAS methodology. You consider each of the solutions to be a possible hypothesis, a potential hazard. Then you test the hypothesis. Does the system have the resources to make that possible failure happen? And you repeat the process, and now you create a list, and you turn the crank, uh, as I showed earlier, steps two, three, four. So just recalling that resources are substances, fields, space, time, information, function, it's handy to have a checklist because when you're given a blank sheet of paper, sometimes you forget about the volume or the edges or the points or the past or the present or the, or the motions. More specifically, uh, this is adapted from Innovation Workbench. You should make a, a checklist of potential actions keeping in mind that there's mechanical actions, thermal, chemical, electrical, magnetic, biological, electromagnetic, as well as information and psychological actions or reactions. With respect to moments in time, we previously listed past, present, future. That isn't awfully useful. We think in terms of, however, the specific moments in time, such as periods of disturbance in an otherwise monotonous operation or process, when things change, when they become suddenly stressful or uh, high priority, periods during which newcomers or visitors arrive into the scene or new elements are introduced into the system, periods of high emotional stress, periods following a catastrophe or a failure, test periods, and the list can actually go on. But making this list allows you to not miss potential opportunities that aren't plainly apparent when you're designing or inventing your device. In an analogous fashion, we can also look at space in terms of specific weak and dangerous zones. So we look for zones that are subjected to the action of particularly high intensity fields, like high forces or high uh, magnetic fields or high uh, flow or abrasion or the like. Then zones of junctions between systems is often uh, a source of failure and error. Particularly conflict zones where you have uh, equal and opposite or reacting forces for example. Zones that are known to cause uh, problems. Uh, what we might call a bad history zone. Zones that have to either perform multiple functions or in which multiple functions kind of uh, converge. And then places in which the user interacts with the object. So the tool interacts with the article. We can also look at the system in a hierarchical fashion. We can look for generic failures that affect the entire system at the system level. Or within the system, there are many devices. And within the devices, there are many components. And within the components, there are materials. And then surrounding the system, or maybe arguably part of the system, are the natural objects or systems that interact with, uh, with the invention or the system of, um, of study. And again, this is a, a type of checklist so as to not miss different uh, hierarchies or different spaces in which failures can occur. Here's a simple illustration. Scenario in which patients in a personal care facility are found to be mysteriously not responding to their medications. So if we map out the procedure in a, uh, a contradiction diagram or a function link function diagram, we see that nurses place the pills in a cup. They leave the pills with the patient. The patient is then supposed to put them in their mouth, drink a glass of water, 
which results in an empty cup, and the nurse returns later on, confirming the pills have been taken. Problem solved. Well, if this works, pills transferred to the mouth allows them to be swallowed, enter the bloodstream, reaches the tissue and cells, and does what it's supposed to do. But if you have a non-compliant patient, patient may hide the pills, which also would result in an empty cup, which would falsely make the nurse believe that the pills have been taken. So this is a very simple contradiction diagram that reveals alternative ways of solving the problem, which we can apply trees. I'm not going to do that right now. Another um, example from the reading in uh, Tul Gawande had to do with the early days of anesthesia when approximately 3,500 deaths were caused by medical errors. This engineer, Jerry Cooper, you may remember, he introduced human factors analysis to address the problem. And today, the error rate is 1 in 200,000. So this is the way things are supposed to work. The anesthesiologist is supposed to be checking vitals regularly. Um, adjusting the ventilator settings, adjusting the anesthesia delivery to assure that oxygen is being delivered, CO2 is being removed, um, that the anesthesia plane is correct, which in turn leads to a speedy recovery. Delivery of oxygen also requires that the endotracheal tube be placed correctly. So if we now introduce some conflict, we learn that sometimes the anesthesiologist fails to check the vitals or misses an event. And it's found that it's due to the anesthesiologist becoming bored, which in turn you can assume is due to the surgery taking a long time, or maybe any other number of factors, maybe the temperature in the, uh, in the operating room or the long uh, shifts that the anesthesiologist have to, have to endure. The errors in adjusting the um, anesthesia machine are found to be due to inconsistent controls. Sometimes they turn left, sometimes they turn right, sometimes it's switched up, switched down. And there's another um, possible interference. And then, of course, there's always inexperience that could um, interfere with the correct trace placement of the, of the tube or, for that matter, any of these actions. And remember, that was the basis of that story. Um, in Atul Gawande's book. So once again, having a contradiction diagram now makes you ask or allows you to ask, find another way to, or find a better way to, or find a way to avoid dot, dot, dot. So for example, the anesthesiologist becoming bored, well, how about rotating um, people within the operating room, taking turns? The um, feedback that has a human in the loop for um, uh, controlling the settings can be replaced by a machine, by an automatic feedback control. The controls can be standardized. It seems like a no-brainer. It's obvious. But it was, if it was so obvious, then it would have been done long ago, and the problem would never have existed. It should have been done when the system was designed. And I'm arguing that it could have been if proper failure analysis, hazard analysis, was performed. Inexperience could be addressed through simulators, another reference in that article that we read. And um, introducing a pulse oximeter, a CO2 monitor, assures that the endotracheal tube is placed um, correctly in the trachea and not the esophagus. And then you can imagine extrapolating on this diagram, making it more complicated, having a much richer set of potential uh, remedies. Okay, a couple more definitions because they're relevant. Something called an open coupling. This is a design feature that results in failure, but it allows a single failure to become a triggering event resulting in a system-wide failure that propagates um, to affect the patient and user safety. So it's kind of like um, part of a domino effect. I use the example of the space shuttle O-ring, which may be dated, but it was one little thing that uh, conspired with other factors that caused the entire space shuttle to, um, uh, to blow up in space. A closed coupling is also a feature that causes failure, but it captures a single failure, preventing it from propagating. 
and causing system-wide failure. So the failure is therefore contained to prevent an accident. And I use an example of rip-stop fabric, um, something you might see, let's say, in a parachute. Right? You, if you get a rip in a parachute, you don't want it to rip like a bed sheet. You want it to stop and not propagate. And I do that by introducing uh, fibers uh, woven into the fabric that are stronger than the, um, than the native fabric. You may also have seen that in um, winter coats, goose down coats, and the like. Returning to the Deepwater Horizon, I wanted to also point out that it was not one thing that caused this explosion. It was a, a comedy of errors. And if you have read the story, you see there was a sequence of just bad luck, mishaps, omissions, um, failures of um, maintenance and follow-up and training that all conspired to create this horrible accident. Which uh, reminds me of a quote that was um, written by this lady, Lisa Belkin, who wrote a book, How Can We Save the Next Victim? She says, it's virtually impossible for one mistake to kill a patient in the highly mechanized and backstopped world of a modern hospital. A cascade of unthinkable things must happen, meaning catastrophic errors are rarely a failure of a single person. They're almost always a failure of a system. Miscommunication, uh, the failure of, of backup systems, um, the combination of resources creating uh, a hazardous or poisonous situation. Here's another illustrative example, the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. It's an amazing, innovative structure. It's a work of art, a marvel of architecture. And it illustrates that inventing something new that's never been done before now exposes you to failure modes that you've maybe never seen before. It had this polished stainless steel skin. It was completed in October 2003. And when it was finished, the visitors immediately realized a problem with its construction. What was happening is these sweeping curves in the roof, they acted like a parabolic mirror, focusing the sun rays like a laser on nearby buildings, intersections, and people on the sidewalk. It's exactly like that mirror that we intentionally used in our solar cooker to um, uh, create that stove for um, uh, global health. Temperatures exceeded 140 degrees Fahrenheit in some cases. And uh, in addition, drivers that were driving and passing by were blinded by the glare of this, this focused. So now going back in time and imagining that we're using AFD to mitigate hazards, our goal would be to cause harm intentionally. On a system level, let's say to make the structure collapse, device level, component level, a material level, let's say, to make that stainless steel skin corrode or change color or flake off, or with respect to the natural objects or systems that interact with the structure. So let's think about the people as our natural objects. We want to injure the people in some way. We make a list of resources. This is a short list. There are materials. There's the skeleton of the structure and the skin of the structure. The skin is made out of stainless steel. It has a certain density, electrical conductivity, a heat conductivity, reflectivity, a color, a shape, etc. The environment has gravity. We always throw in gravity. There's sunlight. There's air, etc. And we can continue, but I'll stop right there. Because with this list, if I intentionally wanted to injure a um, passerby or blind a uh, uh, a passing car, I could use the reflectivity, the shape, and the sunlight to basically create a, a solar cooker to toast the visitors to the center. Here's another quick example. Coca-Cola had this brilliant idea to make their posters out of Velcro. It was supposed to promote their new grip model. The company placed them on these bus stop shelters in Paris, and what they did not count on was for people with cashmere sweaters and expensive clothes to rub up against them. You think the people would hate them, but parenthetically, actually, somehow this caused uh, sales of 
of coke to actually increase. But still, it's just an illustration of not thinking uh, an invention all the way through. Um, I have a, a number of case studies that I've uh, covered in my medical devices uh, class. I just want to pick one out of, uh, out of... Okay, here's the case study. It's actually rather detailed, and I could have you read it, but instead I'm going to read it to you, and I'm going to do so with the Reader's Digest abbreviated version. It has to do with a 52-year-old male that presented to the ER with headaches and malaise, history of hypertension and diabetes, diaphoretic, alert, responsive, vocal, glucose 202, blood pressure elevated. They started an automatic uh, blood pressure monitor and gave him nitroglycerin. They then wanted to transfer him to the CT department, the CAT scan. The first thing that went wrong is the stretcher could not get through the doors. It, wasn't the, it was too big for the doorways in this hospital. So they had to route through an alternative path to the CT department. In the process, um, an O2 bottle started to become empty because it took th that much extra time. Uh, the blood pressure cuff, it didn't fit the monitor in the CT suite once they got there. And there were no other cuffs in the CT suite. The nurse tried jerry-rigging a cuff, but wound up puncturing it in the process. Result was now an unstable patient kind of stranded in the CT department on vasoactive drugs with no matter. Once they finally collected, uh, connected this patient to the BP monitor, it displayed the single rapidly changing number rather than the usual systolic diastolic. So they had to guess or surmise that that number was the mean arterial pressure. One nurse became distracted trying to program the monitor. Another nurse went to get a manual cuff. Eventually, they found that the blood pressure was 112, which is pretty high. Now the patient's losing consciousness, becomes bradycardic, that means the heart's slowing down, unable to protect his airway, means his trachea is clogging up and he's unable to breathe. So they, they transferred him back to the stretcher for intubation, and they were going to... Um, uh, suction his airway, but the wall adapter didn't work. So they um, then wanted to connect it to another wall adapter, but the tubing wouldn't reach. So a, an additional um, tubing was added using a nasogastric tube that they found in the room. Now due to all of this delay, the battery that's powering the infusion pump uh, ran out. Second pump was, uh, was procured, a separate IV line was established. The staff now attempted to connect the pulse oximeter to the CT monitor. It was incompatible. Instead, the O2 sat was only visible from the foot of the bed. A resident requested suction for the intubation. The nurse was distracted with the BP monitor facing the wrong way, didn't hear him, and the tracheal tube got misplaced in the esophagus, something we've heard of before. Two physicians now attempted to change places, but it was difficult because of the limited space between the stretcher and the CT gantry. And the stretcher couldn't be moved without disconnecting the lines. Finally, the CT scan was performed, revealing a large intracerebral bleed. So now, transporting him back to the emergency department, the O2 tank ran out again, because it had not been turned off after connecting to the wall adapter. And then th the story actually goes on and on. The fusion pump alarm was com uh, repeatedly going off until it actually stopped working. BP monitor alarm went off. Um, the display was too small, couldn't be read. Um, pages went off during this, um, this entire um, episode. And the charged nurse's um, radio frequently went off with routine messages. So what is the moral of the story? Why am I telling you this long story? It just shows this sequence of a comedy of errors that was actually documented in this book to illustrate how many things can go wrong when you're not prepared or you don't consider the use environment in which you're going to operate to assure that there is interoperability, there's interconnectivity, that, um, that um, gurneys go through doorways, um, and on and on. So this could have all been avoided with some advanced hazard analysis. One more case that illustrates um, the use of um, 
resources. So this was a, um, an electrosurgery um, procedure. It was a, a polypectomy. Uh, just a little bit back around of electrosurgery, if you don't know, it's called electrocautery or sometimes called Bovi because that's the name of the company. And the way it works is that uh, electrical current actually flows from a generator to an electrode that's on a little wand. The patient is on a, uh, a metal plate. And by closing that circuit, um, you basically burn the tissue that's at that wand. Um, you know, that's the summary of the procedure. So, th as I said, there's a polypectomy. They inserted a sigmoidoscope that goes into the rectum and then into the sigmoid colon. And something happened. Can you imagine what could have possibly happened? Let's say it's your job to do advanced failure determination on this procedure. Well, y you may imagine electrocution, maybe the patient getting burned, maybe the colon getting perforated. These are all kind of the common sense things based on our experience and kind of what looks obvious. But let's think about the resources and how could we intentionally cause an even more dramatic accident? Can we invent a way to intentionally injure the patient? Well, the correct answer is the use of methane, right, which exists in the colon. So to make a long story short, the current was turned on to that cautery. There was a sudden violent explosion within the bowel causing a blue flame to shoot out the end of the sigmoidoscope for a distance of one or two feet. The sound was audible in the adjoining room accompanying the explosion. The patient obviously um, screamed and started to climb up the table. So it's not something that they were trained to anticipate. But another illustration of applying um, these principles to try to um, anticipate the unanticipated. Once we have found design features or environmental situations that need attention, what can we do? Well, we can apply trees and think of um, inventive ways to provide alternatives or backups or what have you. This is just a short list of what's commonly done. Sometimes we add redundancy. We have a duplicate or backup system. Like in the space station, there's always a backup computer. Um, sometimes there's other kinds of fail safes, like um, an example in a trunk. Once upon a time, it was possible to get locked in the trunk and not get out. Now there's a little handle you can pull on that is kind of the backup plan or the, um, you know, the escape route. Um, of course, you can add quality by more expensive materials, higher tolerances, but this adds cost. And it's kind of one of the last resor resorts. Um, if you're going to expect failure, like in a device, uh, or an assembly, well, you can add a layer of quality control or inspection to at least remove the devices before they enter operation. And then, as part of best practices and a requirement by the FDA, you have to actually do experiments on the bench and in patients that validate and verify that everything works the way you said it would work, and that in so doing, you're actually addressing the needs of the patient. And then they're really simple things like rounding corners or not creating parabolic mirrors that is just built in intrinsic safety. And that's really the ideal system is the one member that doesn't need to exist. And there are many, many others. That's the whole point of bringing trees into the, uh, the, in the design. Another example that you're familiar with is something uh, that's called a forcing function. Uh, it has a definition. It's an aspect of a design that prevents the user from taking an action without consciously considering information relative to that action. So it prevents us from doing something stupid unconsciously without thinking. Like sticking your finger into uh, a food processor and hitting the, the go button. 
it forces a conscious attention to something, for example, um, like a, um, a gate that lowers before you can exit a, uh, a library. Um, so it, it deliberately disrupts you, um, not necessarily with like an alarm or a light, but with something that actually interrupts your, um, your um, actions. So another example, I think I have it in the next slide, is um, take that back. Is the uh, shift lever in your car? You're unable to shift it into any gear unless you have your foot on the brake pedal. That's a forcing function. It's an interlock, and it prevents us from just doing something stupid. Which I'm going to confess that with my manual shift car, I've actually done that before. Um, shifted the. Uh, I don't want to get into it, but it was embarrassing. So that leads us back to the use of trees. And uh, just a reminder that we um, created a contradiction diagram as a baseline. And then we used trees to think of another way to think of a way to prevent. And in so doing, not only identify potential hazards, but bring them out. Oh, there is the forcing function. I have the slides backwards. Um, so you've probably seen um, microwave ovens that have interlocks. You can't open the door until it, uh, the timer goes to zero. Um, uh, as you can imagine, there are uh, protective mechanisms in the defibrillator. For example, if you can see that teeny tiny red button, you have to put both thumbs on the respective buttons in order for this to discharge. And that way it forces you to not have your hands um, free to be electrocuted um, when using the um, uh, electric. And then one last example is um, a safety syringe. So needle pricks in the hospital is, is a rampant problem. And if there's hepatitis or AIDS or any number of nasty things, um, it could be really catastrophic. So there's been a lot of effort to try to develop this this um, quintessential um, safety needle. And this is an example of one that's um, rather clever that forces you to basically discard and contain the pointy part of the needle before you can um, guard the uh, syringe. The last resort, when you can't design out um, a, a hazardous feature is to add labeling. Not responsible for damage caused by our car wash. Caution real. And it leads us to um, more labels that are prompted by human behavior. And um, I have a collection of them. This is just a sh short list that of, I think, kind of fun, silly ones that you can read on your own. And I also have a collection of what I call broken labels. So here's a shredder. And I don't know what this sign is trying to tell. And another contradiction diagram. More contradictions. And then my favorites are some of these errors from Microsoft. And this is a particularly funny one. Don't go right, don't go left, don't go straight. You're rude. All right, I'm leaving you with some references because one day you may actually have a job in a medical device company or any kind of technological company and be responsible for either directly or indirectly hazard analysis. So there are a lot of um, good resources, both standard practices, guidance documents, and then books like the Atul Gawande book, or Petrosky has a series of books. One of his um, classics is To Engineer as Human. That, um, that just, it gives you some experience that you can't possibly acquire on your own. And it gives you yet a victory of um, of ideas and inventive principles to avoid hazards and just make safer, more effective products. 
All right, that was a long lecture. It took me forever to assemble. I hope you got something out of it. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday, and we will pick up where we left off.